Good evening. We're delighted you're here. Uh, my name is Neil Graboy. I'm the Dean of uh, Milano uh, GPIA, uh, otherwise known as uh, Milano, the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Public Policy. Uh, from time to time, and especially when there are fast-breaking events that are of national or even worldwide significance, we organize a, distinct, a distinguished panel to shed light on events. Uh, the last one was uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, when WikiLeaks broke, we had a very special panel, uh, including the former ambassador to the then Soviet Union and later to Russia, uh, who regaled us with stories about the cables he wrote. Uh, but I'm sure they were all wonderful, but nevertheless, uh, it gave us a lot of insights, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of insights tonight. Uh, the next panel uh, we've organized, after this one, will focus on the impact of federal, state, and uh, local budget crises on our cities. And we'll keep you informed when we're uh, further along in the planning. But tonight, we focus on extraordinary things that are happening in the Middle East, uh, where a truly unbelievable group of nations are trying to reconceive themselves. Although it's still early in the process, there are generally encouraging signs, uh, save for the not unexpected uh, situation, sadly, in Libya. Uh, to help us understand the evolving situation, uh, my colleagues, Steve Collier, Tom O'Donnell, and Jonathan Bach, have organized this special panel, which Tom will introduce and moderate. But before I present Tom, who's a member of the GPIA, the Graduate Program in International Affairs, I'd like to thank the Global Studies Program for joining GPIA in sponsoring this panel. And finally, I want to thank uh, Minerva Muskis and Suzanne Longley for all the work they did in making the arrangements for this very special evening. And finally, uh, when it comes time for questions, there are some microphones around and I ask you to speak into the microphone so that this substantial crowd uh, can hear your question. And with that, Tom. Well, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Neil. Um, first off, I just want to point out this um, event is being live video uh, streamed on the web. And um, if people could sort of avoid the camera uh, in, the, in, the middle, in the middle aisle, I mean, uh, it would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> So I want to welcome here our uh, distinguished guests, experts on the Middle East. Of course, as everybody knows, we're in the, what turns out to be the you know, uh, 2000, 2011 a revolutionary year. Uh, this is one of those things that don't get planned ahead of time, and nobody knows about ahead of time, but it happens. This has happened various times in history where revolutions have swept parts of the world, and it takes a long time to understand what the full consequences are going to be. And so tonight what we've done is we've invited uh, people who've worked their entire life, their entire professional life, on countries in the Middle East and to bring to us their knowledge, their expertise, their insights, their predictions of what might develop and actually to understand what's going on. So um, I don't want to make much ado about this. We don't have a, a lot of time. We'd, we, I want to have it sort of uh, content rich, okay? So I'm going to try to move right along and the first person I uh, would like to introduce, start with, is Dean John uh, Vanderlip. And John is our Associate Dean here of History and Associate Dean of Faculty and Curriculum at the New School for Social Research. He's the author of Politics of Turkish Democracy, as well as other publications on the history and politics of the Turkish Republic. And what John is going to speak about tonight is going to give a more overview of things. He's going to speak about the American influence in the Middle East in light of recent developments. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Neil. And thank you to the GPIA program for having this panel tonight and for inviting me. It seems like it was only about a year ago that Barack Obama went to Cairo to give his speech there, and he said the reason why he was there was to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world. 
It was, I think, part of an effort to change American relations and perceptions of America in the Middle East. He proposed five areas of conversation and cooperation while he was in Cairo, uh, but I've summarized these basically into three main kinds of points in his speech. First, he said, <clears throat> and this might be a, a sort of Obama doctrine, I suppose, he said the Bush doctrine was over, America was not at war with Muslims, there was no clash of civilizations. Second thing he called for was what I would call neoliberal cosmopolitanism. That is, Barack Obama proposed the free market as a kind of global public sphere in which all people, Muslims, Christians, Americans, Egyptians, and all, would meet and debate their issues. Third major theme in his speech and in subsequent speeches that he gave was that America supports moderate Islam. You may remember this as a Bush era term, uh, but Barack Obama has kept moving on this kind of uh, theme here. His version of moderate Islam, I would say, is a kind of neoliberal version of Islam. That is, it's a private form of Islam. It's not a state-sponsored Islam as in Iran. It is rather a form of modernized and reformed Islam, kind of secularized cultural kind of expression, and most importantly, perhaps, it's nonviolent. And so, as I was thinking about what to say tonight and, and thinking about this panel, I was thinking about, about the current developments in the Middle East, and are they, how are they connected? To America? Are they connected in some way of, to American influence? Uh, did Barack Obama perhaps have some effect on Egyptians and people in North Africa? Or perhaps maybe this is a proof, proof that um, social, the new social media is where really where the, the future lies. I don't know. So the question I had is, did U.S. actions facilitate somehow the emergence of opposition in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Bahrain, other countries. Did U.S. actions or U.S. influence encourage demonstrations? Have U.S. actions or influence shaped the direction that these protests have, have taken? Is there some kind of evidence that the Americans have uh, led in some way to the collapse of the various dictatorial regimes in the Middle East? For me, the simple answer is no. I think it's important to be wary of giving America credit for anything that's happening in the Middle East. I don't think it's really about America. After all, consider what kinds of signals the U.S. was giving off during these events of the last couple of weeks. A confusion of events, a profusion of different kinds of uh, opinions and viewpoints here. Um, we like gradual change. We like reform from the top down. Um, we like demonstrations, but not if they lead to you know, violence and the overthrow of regimes and um, cutting off the oil supplies and things like that. So I think in general, what I would say is that there was across most of these Arab countries that have seen revolts in the last few weeks, a sort of general disappointment in what the Americans had to say. Now, this is not, of course, something new. This is, I think, a reflection of long-standing, long-term American policies, American uh, views, American influence in the Middle East. People who have been living with the Americans for several generations now. I think most of all, the Obama doctrine has really meant the continuation of neoliberalism of the past generation. I think, go back to Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher. It was around that time when things began to change globally, and the Middle East has now lived with a generation of this neoliberal experiment of privatization, the market, those kind of things. And I think that it wasn't the change that Obama promised. That was a campaign slogan, I remember. It was the lack of change that seemed to result after that. It was business as usual for Americans in the Middle East. It was the failure to bring some kind of change, to reflect some kind of change, to uh, bring hope How about that. Current events in the Middle East, I would say, to the extent they're related to the U.S. at all, reflect really the failure of the Obama doctrine in the region, globally, and I think at home in America. Remember that unlike most Americans, people in Egypt can find the U.S. on a map. 
And so they're aware of what's going on in the United States. They know what's happening in terms of domestic politics in the U.S. They follow the news. They follow uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and all those kinds of things, too. And so I think what they saw, really, and uh, again, the WikiLeaks thing, I'm sorry I missed that event, but the WikiLeaks documents, I think, are also an important part here because one of the things that those documents did was make very palpable and vivid the hypocrisy of American policy in the Middle East. Right? And that's what people were reacting to in some sense, a lack of change, a lack of perception of the future was going to change, and this sort of slam it in your face kind of thing about what Americans had been up to. The major element, I think, in all these uprisings are the immediate concerns. It's jobs, it's food prices, it's corruption, it's the brutal oppression of these regimes, it's the suppression of dissent, it's the impact. I'm oh, sorry, I gotta flip my page here. An undeniable failure of neoliberalist policies over the past generation or more in each of these countries that have seen opposition movements flourish. But I think it's also important to keep in mind that this is not some kind of big, massive kind of thing, you know, Arabs revolt kind of business. It's not like this is the same thing in Libya as it is in Tunisia or in Egypt or Bahrain. There are always local elements here, right? There are local things that are going on here. And history also matters, I think. The past matters. These uh, uprisings have been in the making for a long time. They reflect long-term concerns, the rejection of regimes, regimes that have gotten support for the, from the United States, that depend on trade and investment from the United States for generations. They are rejection of this sort of neoliberal worship of the market and its impact on the people of the Middle East. Right? It's about jobs and bread prices and those kind of things. To rejection of privatization, the resultant inequality, oppression, the unequal development in the Middle East. It is, I think, also a rejection of American claims that the U.S. is a positive or even necessary force in the Middle East. So I think I would argue, well, I don't, don't think, I, what I would argue is that the central causal factor that I think does cut across all of these uprisings across these countries is the failure of neoliberalism. It's the commoditization of social relations, these market-based solutions to everything, right? If there's inequality, we need to end subsidies, and so people will get jobs or whatever it is they do when they can't afford food. State abandonment of responsibilities for basic human needs, like health care, education, jobs, housing, food. It's the privatization of assets and the transfer of ever more wealth to the ever more wealthy. It is also the concurrent delegitimization of regimes in the Middle East and in the US, and of the US, I should say, in the Middle East and globally. So I think those are the, the causes that are, for me, the root causes. The revolts in the Middle East are not about secularism and Islamism. They're not about the veil. They're not about those symbols. It's not about culture. It's not about those things. It's about neoliberalism and its failures. OK, you asked for predictions. Hell, I don't know. Did I? <laughs> oh, yeah, we did. That's right. <laughs> what I could say is this, that I think that the most important change that's going to happen or could happen in the Middle East going forward is the rejection of neoliberalism. That is, if that is the, the case, that seems to be the, be the most significant thing, and that would be the most significant change, I think, in the Middle East and probably globally in a long time. It's rejection as people challenge their fear of their own oppressive dictatorial regimes. They go out into the streets. They demand that the states place the needs of people over the needs of capital. But change doesn't happen just because you've gotten rid of Mubarak or his sons or his you know, daughters-in-law or his aunts, aunts, aunts and uncles and the other you know, 42 relatives that live in palaces or wherever. It's not just overthrowing governments. What will transform the destruction of regimes into full-blown revolutions? That is a transfer of political power, reorganization of economic relations, realignment of the social order in the Middle East. That's the real question here, right? Going forward, what is it that's going to lead to change? You got rid of Mubarak. Now the military's in power in Egypt. So what do you get? Mubarak too? Right? He was from the military, after all. So I think it is here that I see the main connection, the main sort of thing that, 
that uh, brings the Middle East and the United States together in this time of uprising, not only in the Middle East, but in the Middle West. The question is, I think, about not whether Americans have any role in shaping the Middle East going forward. I think the revolution, or the question here for me is, can revolutions in the Middle East succeed? The revolution at home doesn't succeed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jen. <clears throat> Our next speaker at the far end is Professor Zachary Lachman. Uh, professor Lachman is Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies and History at New York University, where he's taught uh, modern Middle Eastern history there since 1995. His main research and teaching field is the socioeconomic, cultural, and political history of the modern Middle East, especially Israel, Palestine, and Egypt. Uh, Professor Lachman served as president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America in 2006 through 7, and um, he, he uh, also has a, a number of uh, his, well, let me just mention a couple of his most recent books, uh, Contending Visions of the Middle East, The History and Politics of Orientalism from Cambridge Press. Another one is Comrades and Enemies, Arab and Jewish Workers in Palestine, 1906 to 1948, and also Workers on the Nile, Nationalism, Communism, Islam, and the Egyptian Working Class, 1882 to 1954. And with that, we welcome Professor Lachman. Sure. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you all for coming, and, and thanks to all of those who, who organized tonight's event. It's, it's gratifying to see how many people have turned out um, that suggest that there's continuing interest in what's going on in the region. Um, uh, I personally have been waiting for these events for several decades, <laughs> so I'm enormously excited, um, however things turn out. Um, I should say that I'm a historian, which means that I have the privilege of predicting the past rather than the future. <laughs> In about 10 years, perhaps I'll write a book explaining why everything had to turn out exactly as it actually did. Um, but for the moment, I won't venture uh, to say much about the future. Um, and some of what I'll say will, will echo some of what, what John said. Um, with specific uh, reference to Egypt. And I'd like to talk about some of the dimensions of the popular uprising in Egypt that per have perhaps not received the attention that they, that they merit in the, in the media in, in this country in the kind of instant analyses that, that we've seen. Um, I should begin by saying that I, I certainly have nothing but respect and praise for the uh, young people who took to the streets on the 25th of, of January. Um, we're here on the 24th of February, so if we think back a month, um, what has happened was simply unimaginable, right? So if we had been here on the 24th of January, the idea that the, the Egyptian people could take to the streets and bring down the dictator Hosni Mubarak was beyond imagination. And I suspect it wasn't even quite imaginable by the young people who took to the streets on the 25th, inspired by the events in Tunisia. Um, and determined to go out there and put their lives on the line and face the security apparatus and um, simply refuse to go on living the way they'd been living. The Egyptian people, all of us, owe, owe, these, owe them a great deal. Having said that, I'd also say that um, the media have, have focused on them, perhaps to the exclusion of, of other aspects of, of, of this movement. Uh, on these very articulate, uh, generally well-educated young people. Uh, a lot of them turn out to speak English, which is not typical of the Egyptian population uh, at large. And more broadly, perhaps, the, the, this uprising, this, this enormous popular uprising, has been framed as being about um, freedom and democracy. Now, of course, it was about freedom and democracy. This popular movement remains about freedom and democracy. But I think we need to complicate this story a little bit and pay some attention to the broader social context in order to really understand what, has, what happened in those amazingly dramatic 18 days, but also where things are now and where they are, are going, or at least what the issues are that the Egyptian people are facing uh, from here on in. We've heard a lot about Facebook and Twitter, and of course, they were important, but they were a tool, right? They were a tool early on, but this movement was sustained when the, the Egyptian regime shut down the internet, right? It didn't disappear when they shut down cell phones. It was sustained, in fact, it grew enormously. And from day to day, more and more people from a very broad range of, of 
social uh, strata joined this, this movement. And in fact, a, a, only a small minority of Egyptians have access to Facebook and, and Twitter or the internet altogether. So that doesn't explain why, why this became a genuine mass popular uprising. So perhaps the first thing to be said is that this didn't come out of nowhere, right? It got the attention of, of the media in this country in the, in the days after the 25th of January. But in fact, anyone who's been to Egypt in recent years knows that the country has been simmering, that the social temperature, so to speak, has been rising toward the boiling point for some years. By taking to the streets from the 25th of January onward, by confronting the security forces, the, the, the young people who, who touched this off provided a spark. But huge numbers proved ready to join them in the weeks that followed and ultimately forced the Egyptian military to toss Hosni Mubarak overboard, to toss overboard the person to whom they'd been loyal for many decades. So if we go back, of course, we can trace the antecedents of this um, back in fact, over the last decade, uh, in many respects. Um, back uh, to the year 2000 and the, the protests in Egypt, uh, and in 2001, 2002, the protests in Egypt, which grew to very large proportions in solidarity with the Second Palestinian Intifada, for example. And, and the people in the streets, even at that stage, were very aware of the, the way, uh, or, or at least share the perception that the regime of Hosni Mubarak was in effect complicit with Israel with regard to its policies towards the Palestinians. And of course, that was magnified with respect to the blockade of Gaza for after 2006-07, right, where the Israeli blockade of Gaza would have been completely impossible had not the Mubarak regime collaborated by shutting down the land border. And this is something Egyptians were very aware of, and a policy which was quite unpopular with Egypt. And criticism of those kinds of policies quickly moved over into criticism of the, the nature of the Egyptian regime itself. There were huge demonstrations in Egypt against the US invasion of Iraq. And again, here too, the, the close relationship between the United States and the Mubarak regime and the fact that the United States was now uh, engaged in an invasion and occupation of another Arab country brought a lot of people into the streets, politicized a lot of people who previously had not uh, been in, involved in politics. This in turn set the stage for the emergence uh, in 2005, 2006 of the Kifaya movement, Kifaya is the Arabic term for enough, enough of the Mubarak regime, and especially enough of the concept that Hosni Mubarak would anoint his son Gamal as his successor, which offended uh, a vast number of uh, Egyptians, this idea that the Egyptian Republic should be transformed de facto into a monarchy, that a son should succeed his father. This is offensive enough that it happens in Syria, but that Egyptians should see such a thing, Egypt should see such a thing was intolerable. Uh, and then finally, the worker protests of 2008, and I think this is extremely important. Uh, some of you uh, may know that one of the, perhaps the most significant of the organizations of the networks um, that touched off the demonstrations uh, that began on the 25th of January was called, the, called itself the April 6th Youth Movement. Why April 6th? Because on this April 6th, 2008, uh, the workers of one of Egypt's main industrial centers, a major textile center, uh, uh, factory town, basically, of Mahal al-Kubra, going back to the 1930s, um, planned a general strike. Right? There's a long history of labor protest in Egypt. Um, and for Egyptian workers, for working people generally, there, there's an inseparable connection between the fact that they lived under a dictatorship and the fact that they lived lives of, of, of desperate poverty. Right? Because uh, since the 1950s, um, and until in, into the 90s, the head of the Egyptian Trade Union Federation was also the Minister of Labor. That was enormously convenient for the regime, <laughs> but it didn't suggest that there was much possibility of independent trade union organization. And in fact, there was none. It was illegal to form an independent trade union, which meant that, that by government policy, workers' wages were suppressed, there was no possibility of organizing, uh, prices rising, it meant the immiseration of the population. I'll come back to this in a minute. So there was a huge wave in 2008 of worker protests. And although this general strike never happened because of police repression, um, that linkage between the, the economic demands, the demand for social justice of, of the majority of Egyptians and the demand for democracy, for political freedom, for the ability to, to organize and, and protest, 
uh, was quite evident, and, and young people uh, involved in, in what, what's happened in the last weeks were inspired by that. And the, the role of much broader sections of the population um, ultimately was, I think, absolutely crucial. The, the death knell of this regime was, was sounded, essentially, on the 9th and 10th of February, right? Remember Mubarak finally uh, was, was tossed overboard on, on Friday. Um, earlier that week, there was an explosion of labor unrest, right? Because uh, people who'd been suppressed for, for decades, literally, um, saw this as their opportunity to take to the streets. They'd been participating in mass demonstrations from the beginning, um, but now to go out on strike, to, to refuse to accept this situation anymore because they understood that their future, their, their ability to have a, a decent life, to provide for their, for, their, for their families, to have any hope of a decent future was crucially dependent on the victory of, of the struggle to overthrow Mubarak. And, um, and that had a, a decisive effect. Now, John talked about neoliberalism. Um, I'd like to take that as, a, as an indication that great minds think alike, although you all may understand it differently, um, <laughs> because I'd like to talk about neoliberalism as well with regard to Egypt. Uh, and of course, when I use the term neoliberalism, it inevitably brings me to Thomas Friedman, who is, of course, the great apostle of neoliberalism. Many of you may have seen his, his um, columns in the Times talking about the the, the heroism of, of the demonstrators in, in Tahrir Square. Um, he was a very big booster of the overthrow of Mubarak, ultimately. That's great, I'm very happy about that. On the other hand, it's worth remembering that the economic policies this, that he, and, and not just him, many others, of course, have been touting for several decades, um, in effect, ruined Egypt over the last several decades and, and led precisely to this explosion of social unrest and mass participation in the uprising. Since the early 1990s, Egypt has been uh, one of the laboratories in which the, the neoliberal economic policies pushed by the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the governments of the United States, regardless of administration, have been put into effect. Uh, this meant um, the selling off of big chunks of the public sector in Egypt, a public sector which developed back in the 1950s and the 1960s under the Nasser government. Uh, often at fire sale prices to cronies of the Mubarak regime. It's meant massive layoffs of workers employed in these enterprise. It's meant, uh, as John alluded to, the reduction of subsidies. Much of Egypt's population uh, is, is able to make it from day to day because bread is subsidized, along with a number of other basic commodities. Right? Bread is provided at cheap prices. Right? And the, that's been whittled away at over the last 10 or 15 years under pressure from the outside, uh, either through price rises or, or that loaf of bread gets smaller and smaller. Everybody knows about this, but there hasn't been much they've been able to do about it. Um, the economy has been opened up to foreign investment, which might be a, a reasonable idea if it was done in some reasonable way, but of course it hasn't. It's been, we've seen sweetheart deals, corruption, lucrative state contracts have gone to cronies of the regime and so forth. And the net result, that the kind of thing that, that Friedman and, and the American government has touted was is rapid growth in the gross domestic product. That's lovely, but there's been very little trickle down. What we get are banks, what we get are, are all sorts of speculative investments, um, but uh, for the mass of the population, um, we've seen falling real wages. You may have seen that figure where something like 40 odd percent of the Egypt's population lives on $2 a day or less. That number is, is doubled over the last that percentage has doubled over the last 20 years, precisely because of the application of these kinds of, of policies. Even more dramatically, we can see this in, in the realm of agriculture, right? Something like half of Egypt's population still lives in the countryside, still depends on agriculture. One of the reforms of the Nasser government after it came to power in 1952 was a land reform. Right? So some land of the very large landowners re was redistributed, but even more importantly, the Nasser government imposed uh, rent controls and security of tenure so that peasants who had no land could rent it at prices that were controlled and they would have security of tenure for that land. And that, that enriched a very large chunk of the rural population. Those policies, again, under outside pressure and to the benefit of certain domestic elements, were rolled back in the 1990s, which led quite directly 
to the immiseration of millions of rural households who now lost security of tenure and faced exorbitant rents demanded by landlords and, and lost the protection they'd enjoyed. And again, this is why the percentage of Egypt's population living on the edge has, has risen dramatically over the last several decades. Exactly. Now, um, people have called what's happened in Egypt a, a revolution. And of course, in some sense, it is. It's an it's a event of tremendous historical importance, not just for Egypt, but for beyond. The fact that people in Wisconsin wish they could emulate the example of people in, in Cairo um, <laughs> is quite a turnaround. Uh, and for those of us who've, who've spent uh, several decades trying to educate the American public about uh, the Arab world and, about, and, and how to confront um, uh, anti-Arab racism and Islamophobia, it's quite dramatic to see how positively these people in the streets of Egypt uh, have been portrayed. I, I have to hope it lasts. Um, but if it's a revolution, it's not yet finished. In fact, in some sense, it's hardly begun. Husni Mubarak is, is gone. But the Mubarak regime is largely intact. Um, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, whose membership remains quite uh, obscure, uh, is headed by General Hussein Tantawi, the defense minister. Um, all, as many of you know, I'm sure, this is the, the gentleman referred to as Mubarak's poodle in American diplomatic cables. Um, these, the generals running uh, Egypt today uh, have no democratic instincts whatsoever. Uh, on top of that, the military controls a significant chunk of Egypt's economy, uh, residential housing, housing estates, developments, shopping malls, factories. Um, I'm going to end right now. And of course, they want to preserve their privileges and their status. Uh, and this means that the democratic movement, the, the huge numbers of people who have been mobilized, um, need to continue this struggle. They want a real change rather than cosmetics changes. They want not just the Mubarak regime without Mubarak. Um, they want something very different, which inevitably will require both a genuine transition to democracy, but also a, a break with the policies of the past, such that Egyptians have some hope of, of a, a social order which um, takes uh, the demand for social justice seriously. Um, I obviously won't predict whether this will happen, but a lot of people have been inspired and mobilized and, uh, and I suspect they will not be ready to, to leave the streets until they've, they've done their best to achieve what they've fought for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zachary. I mean, it's, I hate to be like enforcing the time. If it was only the Egyptian, re only, the Egyptian revolution that took place, we'd have four or five people up here talking just about Egypt and that wouldn't be enough, right? So, I, but we have to move on <laughs> to another country. And uh, uh, next we have Professor Karima Benoon, Professor of Law and Arthur L. Dickinson Scholar at Rutgers Law School. She earned her JD and MA in Middle Eastern, and uh, MA in Middle Eastern uh, North African Studies from the University of Michigan, which is also where she got her JD. Uh, Professor Benoon has spent much time in Algiers. She has very close uh, ties with Algeria. Recently, um, she's been there three times, uh, very recently, writing about the ongoing democracy movement in The Guardian, The Nation, and in her uh, blogs. Um, she was actually there in the last two weekend uh, demonstrations, and we'll see some of that in a moment. During the 1960s civil war between fundamentalist and government forces, she worked extensively with the Algerian uh, women's movement in defense of women suffering from fundamentalist violence. Professor Benoon has served as a member of the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law and Board of Directors of Amnesty International USA and currently sits on the Board of Trustees of the Center for Constitutional Rights and the Council of the, ne I'm sorry, of the Network of Women Living Under Muslim Laws. Um, I can't read everything here, we'd be here for <laughs> her human, no, but I want to say her human rights field missions have included Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Lebanon, Pakistan, South Korea, Thailand, and Tunisia. And uh, I mentioned some scholarly articles, but you have the program and can look at them. So without any more ado, Karima, I'll uh, start this.
I just wanted to share with you uh, some of the pictures that I took and the sound uh, from my time in Algiers because the courage of people in the streets was deeply moving. I thank the organizers for putting this event together. And I thought, given that I'm just back from Algeria, given that Algeria is getting very little attention with everything else that's going on, that that's what I would focus on entirely this evening. Uh, I think John's point about focusing on the specificities of each of these contexts within the broader uh, transnational revolutionary dynamics is a very important one. Even the terminology is very difficult. So for example, our title this evening is Arab Democracy Uprisings, and one would have to be very careful about using that label in the Algerian context because many of the people involved are in fact not Arabs, but they are Kebils or Berber-speaking people. Of course, there are also many Arabs involved, uh, but the movement is, is a sort of pan-linguistic, pan-ethnic. Uh, so I arrived in Algiers on the afternoon of Friday, February the 11th, the day before this big march uh, that you saw some photos from that had been organized by what is called the Coordination for Change and Democracy, or CNCD. And this protest was to, supposed to start in 1st of May Square and go to Martyrs Square, of course, two very evocative names. The organizers were seeking an end to the 19-year state of emergency and nothing less than a change in Algeria's political system. But it should be noted that public demonstrations in the capital city of Algiers are illegal under a 2001 decree, and the authorities had refused that week to give permission for this particular demonstration, making it an illegal assembly and everyone who attended subject to arrest. Now, the news of Mubarak's fall came as I entered the offices of the Algerian League for the Defense of Human Rights in downtown Algiers, where the final planning meeting for the February 12th protest was taking place, and the atmosphere was absolutely electric. Uh, the meeting was sort of broken up by young people chanting and singing and bursting out into the streets, real jubilation, tremendous pride, and a, a sense uh, of the power uh, of people in the region. Uh, of course, uh, some of the youth went out and protested in the streets and were immediately beaten by the police, which certainly didn't bode well for the demonstration that was to take place the next day. And in fact, as you could see a little bit from the pictures, the February 12th demonstration uh, initially sort of turned into the march of the policemen. Something like 30,000 police officers of the riot anti-riot squad were deployed on the streets uh, of Algiers with riot gear uh, to confront something like 2,000 protesters. So, it, you know, the pictures actually don't do justice to the, the courage of uh, the protesters who absolutely refused to leave the streets, who sang, who waved flags, who chanted, who just took over public space and refused to let go. Um, and they chanted things like système dégage, uh, government out, that's not quite the right translation, but from Tunisia. Uh, and they chanted yesterday Egypt and today Algeria. And there were actually small small echoes of Egypt, uh, some of them quite negative. In fact, a large group of young men with the obvious cooperation of the police entered the scene rather violently at one point, chanting in favor of President Bouteflika, who has been in office since 1999, and attempting to provoke fights with the protesters. And as I wrote uh, in, in an article, this was so reminiscent of Cairo that for a moment one half expected a charge of men riding camels, like in Tahrir Square. Uh, that didn't happen, but these counter-demonstrators were a very negative uh, factor. But the single most moving event of the day for me was the women's demonstration. You saw some pictures from that. You heard the women singing. A group of about 50 of the many women who were involved in the protests finally had had enough of the police trying to shut things down. And they took up position as a group near the bus station next to the 1st of May Square, holding large Algerian flags and signs and singing the national anthem. And they simply refused refused to budge. Now, the pro-government uh, youth at this point became extremely confrontational uh, and even started sort of shouting at the women that they were in favor of an Islamic state. I mean, the politics of all of this got very uh, confused. Certainly, the, the protesters themselves were not chanting such things. It was the, it was the pro-government uh, prote counter-protesters who were. Uh, but ultimately, the, the worst moment really came as I watched female police officers v viciously attack this group of women demonstrators uh, beat them, throw some of them to the ground. And of course, the terrible tragedy of this was that their own career paths were indeed only imaginable in Algeria, thanks to the hard work of some of the very women activists they were sort of scraping off of the sidewalk. 
Uh, as many as 350 people were arrested that day, which is 100 more people than the government said had attended the march. The government said 200 people were there. Many of them were roughed up, including the prominent 90-year-old lawyer Ali Yahya Abdenur, who is the honorary president of the League of Human Rights. Sharifa Khadar, one of the women activists you saw in the pictures, uh, who is the president of a group called Jaze Eruna, which is an association of the victims of the fundamentalist terrorism of the 1990s, and it was the 90s, not the 60s, I'm not that old, uh, whose brother and, <laughs> sorry. anyway, sorry, uh, Sharifa Khadar, seriously, uh, the human rights activist president of this association of victims of the terrorism from the 1990s, uh, was arrested twice that day, and I was quite horrified watching the police women manhandle her which, as I said, unfortunately is not an oxymoron. Just before she was arrested the first time, Khedar was attacked by a group of the pro-government, quote, protesters, uh, who were actually in some ways much more dangerous than the police. Uh, they attempted to pull her clothes off, and one of them attempted to simulate sex with her. It was a very frightening situation. A policewoman finally came and dragged her away from this melee, only to help a group of male cops throw her to the ground and arrest her rather than the perpetrators. So you get some sense of the risks that people were taking by being in the streets. But an interesting thing, the situation is very fluid, and I think this says a lot about what could happen in Algeria. As the protest waned, the square was taken over by a large group of these uh, counter-demonstrators who began to take up the, dem the slogans of the anti-government protesters as the day went on. As somebody said, it's possible to rent these youth, but not to buy them. Uh, and they ended up confronting the police. So it was this incredible scene at the end of the day when hundreds of riot police then brought out their guns, which they hadn't had out earlier in the day, uh, and marched in formation and really shut down these sort of turncoat counter-protesters. Now, the next morning, uh, the 13th of February, the organizers met to assess the situation, and they decided to march again the following Saturday. They were really outraged at the way that the protesters had been treated. Uh, and I then spent, the, I decided to, to stay and, and see the next demonstration as well and write about it. Uh, and I had a lot of meetings during the week trying to understand why people were protesting. What are the issues here? So I had a meeting on the 15th uh, of February, which was the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad or Mulud, which is a very big holiday in Algeria. And I spent uh, time with uh, feminist activists, many of whom had been in the demonstration that day. Uh, they had created something called the Observatory on Violence Against Women, and they told me they see what they call the women question as imminently political, so that their coalition joined the coordinating committee organizing the protests. Uh, they wanted issues like the abrogation of the discriminatory family code to be on the change agenda, and so they said, therefore, we too must march. On Wednesday, February 16th, I met Samir Larabi, a young... Uh, unemployed activist with the new National Committee for the Defense of the Rights of the Unemployed. And this is a major phenomenon in Algeria right now. The unemployed are getting organized. Uh, this organization was created in early February uh, and held demonstrations at that time in front of the labor ministry, which were also brutally repressed by the police, and at which a young unemployed man tried to set himself on fire uh, in, uh, to sort of emulate what had happened in Tunisia. Uh, but he was saved by a journalist uh, from one of Algeria's leading newspapers, Al Watan. I went to meetings of intellectuals. One thing that's happening in Algiers, everyone seems to be organizing a committee or a network or drafting a declaration or a set of principles or going out on strike like the students and the paramedics and so many others. Now these particular intellectuals unfortunately were not very optimistic. They said it is not yet the turn of Algeria. Uh, and they were actually quite concerned about what could happen uh, in Tunisia and Egypt. They sort of felt that Tunisia and Egypt were very much not out of the woods yet. And they talked a lot about what had happened back in October of 1988 in Algeria. Uh, there, were, there was a week of riots in which 100 people, excuse me, 500 people were killed by the military. There was then a sort of democratic opening, opening up of opposition political parties, uh, freedom of the press. There was this kind of democratic, optimistic, wonderful moment uh, that all ended, unfortunately, in disaster as the, the military uh, really sort of uh, took power in its hands. There was a very flawed electoral process, a fascist movement, really, uh, uh, 
sorry, I have to you, speak in uh, very clear terms in, in my view, uh, the Islamic Salvation Front rose, really benefited from that environment. Uh, we all know about the cancellation of the elections and then the terrible violence uh, for 10 years that killed 200,000 people. So uh, not to suggest that this necessarily could or will happen anywhere else, but Algerians were very worried uh, about the idea that openings, democratic moments can have unfortunate consequences and they're very concerned about uh, the, the follow-up part to these revolutions. At the end of that particular day, I went to Bebel Wed, which is a sort of legendary uh, popular area near the sea in Algiers that was a stronghold of the Islamic Salvation Front during the 1990s. And I went to visit an association that works with poor youth. Not already. Two more. Uh, this area was home to some of the riots that happened in Algiers in early January that left eight dead and saw over a thousand arrests. An interesting thing, in Bebelwed, I found the activists that I met were almost equally disappointed in the state and in the opposition, neither of which they felt had made much of an effort to reach out to the social base. And they took me out on a tour to meet people at night in, in Babel Wed. So for example, I met a family of eight living in one room. And interestingly, despite their terrible situation, the grandmother of the family was actually an ardent supporter of President Bouteflika and opposed the marches because she was so terrified of a possibility of a return to violence, which is really a fear that the regime has capitalized on. And it gives you some sense of the uphill battle uh, faced by the protesters. Uh, in the street, I met a 50-something fundamentalist who told me there are a lot of buzzards here, that was his word, that only the will of God can chase away. And when I asked about the marches, he said that as long as Babel Wed is not awakened, nothing will happen. And later on, the person who was touring me around said, look, anyone who tells you fundamentalism is dead in Algeria has not been to Babel Wed. So this remains uh, very much an issue in terms of looking at what any kind of transition uh, might look like. They took me to meet a family of five living in one room in what used to be a garage and was transformed into what I can only call so-called housing. And here I met a young father who had a, a degree in psychology, was unemployed, and supported the marches absolutely desperately. He said, I don't need a million dinars, I just need a job, housing, and protection for my children. And the activist told me, really, Bebelwed needs a Marshall Plan. So for them, uh, that is the key issue on the agenda. And it seemed to me that the major challenge in Algeria is bridging the gap between the very dedicated activists that I met in the city above and the people in Babel Wed, to cross the divide between the peaceful protests, uh, often attended by many middle class people, but also by working class people, and the sort of the proletarian emeute, or uh, the riots, which are treated much more brutally, in fact, uh, by the police. Uh, and I think a lot about what Samir Larabi told me, the unemployed activist, uh, sort of sounding like an Algerian Amartya Sen. He said, look, we need democracy to fight exploitation. Bread and liberty are not alternatives. So I think it's really a question of bringing these two uh, agendas together. Now, the protesters did go back out into the street on Saturday the 19th. I don't have pictures to show from that because unfortunately my camera was confiscated. Um, but the protesters were, again, very brave, even though the police outnumbered them. Uh, some of them were quite badly injured. There were a lot of beatings of prominent union leaders and an opposition member of parliament. And I was really struck by what one of that march's leaders told me the night before it happened. He said, either the government accepts peaceful change or they choose closure in which case the youth of the country who have a profound hatred for the government will eventually explode in ways that could have a catastrophic effect on the country and the region. And I really think the Algerian government and the foreign governments which support it would do well to heed this warning and to act accordingly. And I just, I wanted to end by really reiterating in, in a way something that Professor Lachman said, which is that it really behooves us to remember that these movements did not fall out of the clear blue sky two months ago. And the, the flame of social change has been kept alive over long years of struggle in obscurity uh, by very brave activists to whom we ought to pay tribute. And I want to end with the words of one of those in the Algerian context, who is the writer and journalist Mustafa Ben Fodil. Uh, Mustafa was captured and tortured by fundamentalists in 1994 and of late has been regularly arrested by the authorities for staging public readings of his plays, which he struggles to get produced in any of Algeria's official spaces. 
And I wanted to end with an excerpt from the manifesto he attached to his brilliant 2007 novel entitled Archaeology of Chaos, a book which really ought to be translated into English uh, right now. So note that this is my bad English translation. The, the original French text is quite lyrical. He wrote, we need to inaugurate a climate of insurrection in this country. We need a climate of positive instability. We need to organize a huge popular march. We must ban the Minister of the Interior from banning the occupation of the streets. We must ban the Minister of the Interior. We must take back the streets, the sole arena of real democracy. The real battle is in the streets. We must take back history and the memory of the people, which has been distorted by official propaganda. We must celebrate the people, liberate the energy of the unemployed, of delinquents, of losers, and the marginal. We must push the students to demonstrate, the unemployed to complain, the women to their limit, the companies to bankruptcy, the mosques adrift, the imams to derision, the soldiers to desertion, and the young to civil disobedience. The imaginary parliament will be our organ, the organ with which we will urinate on all the official walls and the palaces of our potentates. We need a punctual and diffuse revolution, a revolution of every instant, of every place, of every day. And then he finishes with the announcement that this manifesto will be published in the official journal of the imaginary and poetic Republic of Algeria. So in closing, I would say, let us celebrate these newly emerging imaginary and poetic republics and all their possibilities. Let us honor those who are making great sacrifices to create them. And let us commit to nurturing their development through what may be very difficult times ahead, through continued and engaged solidarity with their founders. Thanks very much. I uh, apologize for my allusion to uh, the 60s. <laughs> Actually, if I was speaking of the 60s, I would be speaking of an earlier generation of Benin uh, resistance fighters who are very well known in Algeria for their contributions to the national liberation struggle. So um, next up, we have Professor Golbar Bashi. And Professor Bashi is a professor of Iranian and Middle Eastern studies at Rutgers University. She holds a PhD in Middle Eastern Studies from Columbia and teaches Iranian Middle East Studies at Rutgers University, also uh, the University of Professor Benoom. Uh, different campus, I think. <laughs> um, she is also a frequent contributor to PBS Frontlines, Tehran Bureau on Women's and Transnational Feminist Issues in Iran and the region. Professor Bashi is closely connected to the Iranian women's movement and part of the social network, which aims at connecting regional activists and helping to disseminate and analyze news. Uh, she recently, by the way, uh, contributed a chapter to a book called The People Reloaded, The Green Movement and the Struggle for Iran's Future. An article, I'm sorry. You want to push the button? Okay, let me, let me set up, I'm going to set up a PowerPoint here. First of all, thank you very much um, to the new school, Professor O'Donnell, uh, for inviting me and having me in this conversation. Even though the uh, the title of this event is Arab Democracy Uprisings, uh, I'm, I'm glad that um, uh, Iran is uh, included. I do come from southwestern Iran, uh, very close uh, to Iraq, um, only a couple of miles. So I do find myself often to be an honorary uh, Arab uh, in Iran, and I'm very incredibly um, proud of that. So thank you very much for including uh, me in this, uh, in this panel. The uh, rise of revolutionary movements across uh, the Arab world have galvanized Iran's civil rights movement uh, that began in 2009. Now, um, in the wake of the spectacular events uh, that we've seen uh, in North Africa, especially, uh, the Iranian uh, green movement, which is called, has been kind of uh, ignored at, um, uh, uh, and so, so what we saw um, in June 2009 was the rise of a civil rights movement in Iran in the aftermath of a fraudulent election when people uh, poured into the street. Some of you may have uh, may remember this. It wasn't that long ago, a year and a half, um, asking basically, where is my vote? 
This was one of the first times Iranians protested uh, in peaceful uh, manners, and uh, it wasn't the question wasn't where is my gun, it was where is my vote. Um, now the opposition movement, uh, which is headed by two senior um, uh, former uh, prime minister and how, uh, speaker of the house, Mir um, Hossein uh, Mousavi and Karubi. Um, Right now, they're under house arrest. Um, and uh, uh, what's interesting that only last week in the Iranian parliament, the members of parliament asked uh, for their public execution. So things are happening in Iran, and the opposition movement has been um, re-energized uh, from the events in Egypt and Tunisia. So we're seeing kind of a, I don't like the domino effect, um, because it just puts everything um, um, in, in these, um, categories that we can't figure out. Yes, please. Um, right, sure. Um, so the, um, the opposition movement has gone through several stages uh, in the past year and a half. It began in, two, in June 2009. And what, what we've seen mainly is, has been the role of women. Uh, again, uh, like Tunisia, like Egypt, like Algeria, uh, we've seen women at the forefront of these um, <laughs> of these events. But, um, the women's rights movement in Iran, like other parts of the Arab world, uh, they predate these recent revolution. It's not just that, uh, you know, there was a Facebook uh, page uh, coming up and uh, women decided to join the protests. Uh, in Egypt, uh, there's, the, the women's movement has been in the making for over 100 years. Uh, the same uh, goes um, to, uh, to Iran and so forth and other parts of the, uh, of the world. So it's, it's important to, to remember that. And the nonviolent aspect of these movements in Iran and in the Arab world um, has been really maintained by women especially. We've seen pictures of Egyptian mothers kissing riot police, giving flowers to them. We saw very similar pictures in, in Iran. Uh, and those are very, um, they have been very powerful. Uh, so women in Iran, as in elsewhere in the region, they're also fighting for um, basic rights, basic freedoms, uh, institutional changes, and so forth. Of course, the interest in, uh, in women's participation in these movements uh, somewhat is curious. Um, I remember reading a blog recently about how not to ask stupid questions about the Egyptian revolution. One of them was, oh wow, there's so many women out there, as if you know the women were hiding and just suddenly they're out. Of course, they've always been uh, part of the democratic aspirations of their nations, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, Egypt, um, and even countries such as Bahrain, uh, we've seen uh, the, the picture right now, just before, was of, of women in, in Bahrain, uh, Tunisia, uh, and, uh, and so forth. I think most of you have seen these pictures. Now, what I wanted to do was to uh, show you precisely the history of women's uh, participation in democratic movements, that this is not a new thing. It's, this is not that women have learned this recently, they have been part of these movements. From nationalist movements, to socialist movements, to Islamist movements, women have been at the forefront of these events. So if we could just uh, go fo uh, forward with uh, these pictures. Um, I wanted to opt for a comparative analysis over three successive uprisings in, in Iran. Um, so I'll start with the 1953 uh, nationalization of oil movement and the ousting of the democratically elected prime minister in Iran by the CIA. I tell my students uh, that the equivalent of the 1953 ousting of Prime Minister Mossadegh would be to bring back Ben Ali to Tunisia uh, by the French or the bringing back of Mubarak to, to Egypt. Uh, and and it, it, it seems to strike a chord. So here we see women, obviously. They're not, the men are shielding them. Um, but they're there. there. You have veiled women, you have non-veiled women, so these are kind of some evidence, and the same goes uh, throughout the region. Women are, have always been part of democratic uh, movements. This picture is from the 1979 revolution, uh, where we see uh, pious um, 
possibly Islamist women demonstrating against the Shah, the monarch in Iran, again, um, showing uh, the massive participation of women. This picture is from uh, March 79. This is two months, uh, a month after uh, the fall of the, the, uh, the Shah, the monarchy in Iran, and uh, the Khomeini's return. And one of the first things they obviously did was to regress on women's rights. So we have women out there in Tehran in thousands um, protesting the, the veil, uh, the imposition of the veil and, uh, and uh, the limitations in family law. Here's a veiled woman who's in fact showing solidarity with the unveiled women, um, militant women. Uh, a lot of the leftist movements in, in 1970s Iran were, were militant and women were part of those. Uh, Again, this is uh, March 8th demonstrations in Iran. We want equal rights. Um, now this is, you know, obviously we're jumping uh, to, uh, two decades. This is 1997, the, uh, the election campaign of President Khatami, the reformist president, who by the way right now is under house arrest, um, two-time president. And first female vice president, um, Mahbube Ebtekar, this is under uh, Khatami's presidency, and Khatami was uh, very open um, compared to his um, peers in, in, uh, uh, on his views and also on his, on his policies. He didn't manage to do much because of the way the Iranian uh, um, uh, sort of uh, political system, uh, aspects of it is democratic and many aspects aren't. Here's Shirin Ebadi, human rights lawyer who won the Nobel Prize in um, uh, the, um, the, the, she's a peace uh, laureate. Uh, she also now lives in, in, in exile. Um, then we've had lots of uh, women's rights campaigns online. Women have been very good uh, from the very beginning when the, um, when the internet became available in Iran to use um, the, uh, the websites in, um, for various uh, feminist campaigns. This one is Stop Stoning Forever uh, campaign, which is transnational, not just in Iran. It, it, it is across the Muslim world. Um, we have other uh, change for, sign for change, and a lot of these websites get filtered over and over again. So they change from .com to .net, to .info, all sorts of uh, uh, things. We have the One Million Signatures campaign. These all began um, uh, with Khatami's um, coming to power when he allowed for some opening of, of civil society. Um, now, the, the, some of the first signs of bold protests in the Islamic Republic we saw by women in 2006. Uh, again, they were peaceful, but they were, they were um, dealt with very harshly. Now, Mir Hussein Musavi came um, to uh, the election sort of circuit in 2009 as the presidential candidate with his wife. His wife is an artist, professor, former vice chancellor of a university. Um, and both of them spoke of women's rights as one of their main uh, campaign promises. And this really energized uh, the, the reform movement, the women's movement, and uh, so we see uh, massive uh, numbers of women in the 2009 uh, pre-election campaign uh, wearing green. Now the color green was the color that Musavi adopted as, as, a, as the color of his campaign. Green has significance in, in Iranian culture, both religious and non-religious uh, significance. It's the color of spring, but it's also color of Islam and, uh, and, and so forth. So lots and lots of fantastic pictures coming out of Iran. Um, happy people, it was a festival. Um, I have my colleague here, uh, Dr. Dabiri um, from Colombia, who was actually in Iran when uh, these things were happening and, and she has written about it and she has some very good pictures taken, um, in fact, in Shiraz, uh, not in Tehran. So what happens is the election results come out in 2009 and um, uh, Ahmadinejad somehow uh, wins a massive landslide, which came to a surprise, uh, obviously. And people came out asking, where's my vote? It was peaceful, but the crackdown was very harsh, very similar to what we saw in, in Tunisia and, and Egypt. Um, again, the women 
maintained the nonviolent aspect of, of the movement. Um, not all women, but the majority of women were part of the, the nonviolent aspect of the movement. So here we see uh, plainclothes uh, security uh, forces beating um, people in the street who are protesting, and you have women, uh, both Islamist and non, you can tell from the dress, uh, coming to the rescue. So we, here you see a woman actually wanting to, she's holding a stone. So not, not all women were <laughs> um, peaceful. You don't, I don't want to essentialize uh, women. Here again, you have a woman trying to stop um, um, a, a security uh, officer from running over a protester. An old lady um, holding the picture of Musavi. Here you have a woman trying to stop uh, pr um, fellow protesters from from um, getting close to the riot police. Mother daughter. So what I wanted to end with, uh, really, is that what I'm very interested in is in the transnational aspect of these movements. Um, I would say the causes. Um, for what we have seen in Iran in the past few years are very obvious. 32 years of militant theocracy, le legal gender apartheid, despite which women have thrived um, spectacularly in education, in, in even law, um, art, cinema, and so forth. International isolation and humiliation of Iranian citizens, blatant inequalities in, in Iran, crumbling economy, massive unemployment, uh, but Iran also has this history of social protest going back to the middle of the 19th century. It um, was one of the first countries in the third world to, um, um, to have a constitutional revolution in 1906, and nationalized oil, 1953, the British weren't very happy about it, as you can imagine, and they ousted an um, autocratic monarch, ending 2,500 um, 2, years of monarchy in Iran. Prospects, uh, I think, are very promising. Uh, demography obviously plays a role. Iran, like its neighbors, um, has a very young population. 80% of, of, of Iranians are under 40. Half of those are under 30. So they're young, they're wired, uh, and they're learning. The Egyptian events, the Tunisian events, um, really galvanized. And we saw um, the, uh, the Valentine's Day protests in Iran um, on, on the day of the Valentine, um, the 14th. And we had um, new um, demonstrations again um, in, in solidarity with the Egyptians and Tunisians, uh, which were banned. Uh, some people got killed, young people, and, and so forth. So I, I, I see it as a very promising um, um, thing, um, and the, the, the most spectacular thing is this transnational solidarity. Um, and I uh, just wanted to show you a couple of pictures by uh, an Iranian artist. Her name is Terme, um, T-E-R-M-E-H, Terme. And she has been doing these spectacular posters. Um, and this is her recent one. Um, and uh, she, po she puts them up on Facebook. Uh, if you, she has a fan page, Terme, um, where she has been doing lots and lots and lots of posters uh, about the Green Movement um, from her own perspective as a young woman. She studied art at the University of Tehran. And she's been doing wonderful uh, posters linking Iran to the Arab world. Um, because despite all this wonderful transnational solidarity, uh, there has been um, attempts by both activists in the Arab world and also scholars um, to, to uh, paint this as a pan-Arab um, um, uh, thing, as, a, as a, you know, the new Arab Spring um, and so forth, and excluding Iran. At the same time, Iranians have also said, oh, well, the Green Movement was first, and we taught the world, um, obviously, there's been other revolutions um, across the region and, and in the world that have um, um, taught one another uh, things. So I, as a feminist, I am concerned about these, uh, the resurrection of these masculinist nationalisms because they exacerbate these false divides. And in it, women's demands get lost. Uh, so I have been a little disappointed by some feminist Arab uh, um, 
activists and colleagues uh, who have um, have used these sorts of terms of uh, uh, of, of nationalism because I do think they are they are not very um, helpful. So I hope that women um, in Egypt, Tunisia, and elsewhere will stand their ground and will uh, make sure that women's uh, concerns, legal and otherwise, are, are met in new constitutions and so forth, because otherwise, um, you know, all of this will become pictures um, and uh, nothing will really happen for, for women, too. Thank you. Sorry, I went over my time. Lord. Thank you, uh, Professor Bashi. Um, well, th those are our initial comments uh, going down. It's a, quite a review of um, some of what's going on in the area. What we would like, what we would like to do now is, I'm um, sort of in the interest of compactness of extracting the maximum information from our experts that we have here. I want to put some. I'm going to put some uh, questions to them, and then uh, in a little while, open it up open it up to people. And so I would have to say that one thing I think is probably on everybody's mind tonight is what is happening in Libya. And uh, while we have you up here, if we could just go down, uh, you can pass or, or make a comment. Um, if we could just quickly go down and, and, and I'm not going to ask you what to say, uh, just <laughs> give it to you. Uh, could we, would it be okay to start with you, Zachary? I, I actually don't know a great deal about Libya. It's obviously a horrific situation. Um, I mean, what, what made the situation in both Tunisia and, and Egypt, I mean, of course, hundreds of people died. We don't want to minimize that. We hear it's peaceful. It's peaceful in relation to Libya, but many, many Tunisians and Egyptians died to overthrow their, their dictators. But of course, the scale of what's going on in Libya is much greater. In large measure, that's because both the Tunisian and the Egyptian militaries refused to open fire on their own people, yes. right? And that isn't quite the case in, in Libya. The military is fractured from what we can tell, it seemed, at least the last mm -hmm. I heard. But there seem to be lots of people ready to, to open fire on their own people. Um, I'll, I'll defer to other panelists who may know more than I do. Would anyone else like to comment? Can go ahead. I can't claim expertise on Libya, but like everyone else, I've been thinking about it a lot. Uh, the Security Council we know met and adopted a unanimous letter. Uh, I wish that they would do more. I wish that they would refer what appear to be crimes in, against humanity in Libya to the International Criminal Court. Libya is not uh, a party to the Rome Statute of that court, so the court cannot exercise jurisdiction uh, otherwise. On Facebook, you can find a whole bunch of sort of lists of things you can do to support the Libyan people, including ways to donate to uh, the Libyan Red Crescent through the International Federations of the Red uh, Crescent and, and the Red Cross. Uh, one of the most moving aspects of watching this to me has been not only the incredible courage of ordinary Libyan people, but also the solidarity being expressed by Egyptian activists. I know that there were doctors, for example, who were in Tahrir Square who are now organizing to travel into, into Libya to offer uh, medical services. And I, I just, I really hope uh, that we all push the United States government to make sure that it takes a position uh, based on principle and based on the interests of the Libyan people and not based on oil interests. I could just make a comment on the oil thing. Uh, just before I came here, I got a report from somebody sent me from Reuters, somebody from the oil sector, and it said there was a rumor that Gaddafi had been shot, and the price of oil, and on that rumor, the price of oil had fallen about three, or f about three bucks, I think, both in Brenton. Uh, if he's shot again, we'll see, and pretty soon we can get a supply curve. And you can imagine what's at the end of the supply, at the bottom of the curve. Anyway, but uh, I'm sorry. John? It's not, it's not a major problem in the market. If, if, if the whole 1.6 million barrels goes off the market, it's not a fundamental problem. There's, there's reserves other places. But I thought the slogan was, no blood for oil. <laughs> well, <laughs> no comment. Did you want to so, make a, a, a comment? No, I don't know much about the Libyan situation. Yeah. I think it was acts, right? That's what I've heard is also that the military seems to be fracturing, and, yes. and that's... Yeah. Seems like it's something that's likely to continue, yeah. but who knows what the results will be. Yeah, no, I mean, it's apparently, uh, there's I, one report I just heard in the BBC, there was uh, five tanks in one square, and the people were saying they were controlled by the revolutionaries. The people had taken the tanks. So it's a very oh. intense situation. Um, mm -hmm. I would also just like to um, also ask briefly about the, uh, over here, the other side <laughs> of, of the uh, Middle East, uh, especially uh, the events in, uh, in Bahrain and uh, in the media, there's a lot of talk. Of course, it's 
Bahrain, the, the majority pop of the population are Shia, similar to Iran. And of course, in the oil producing region of Saudi Arabia, there's, uh, uh, I would have to say, a, a fairly sub repressed um, uh, Shia minority that worries the Saudis quite a bit. And so what's being said in the media is that there's geostrategic and other concerns that this might be a play by Iran, their hand is in it. So I'm asking, to what, to what degree does this emerge from uh, indigenous issues? To what degree might the Iranians be playing a hand and so forth? If, and also, what does this mean um, as far as impacting Saudi Arabia? We've been hearing quite a bit about uh, complaints from the people in Saudi Arabia also recently. If, if anybody would like to talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, Iran has been the great boogeyman for, for these Arab autocracies for, for decades now, yeah. right? It's, it's these outside agitators, right? This is what ruling classes always say. It's the outside agitators. Mm -hmm. Our people are happy, but then these people come yeah. in from the outside and they're paid agents and stir them up. They said the same thing about the protests, right? You know, they were, they were getting fed with Kentucky Fried Chicken because there's an outlet in Tahrir Square. So who, is, who is giving them all that free fried chicken, right? <laughs> and, and Gaddafi's been ranting about Al-Qaeda and bin Laden as being behind this, right? So it's, it's yeah. something that regimes have used both to get support from the United States, right? Yemen is the classic example of this at the moment, right? The, oh, uh, course, Ali Abdullah yes, Saleh yes, has been yes. the, the dictator of Yemen uh, since 1980, right? So he's in the Husni Mubarak class. And in recent years, he's been getting hundreds of millions of dollars from the United States as uh, allegedly the bulwark against the, the Islamist threat, the Al-Qaeda threat, um, and runs this very repressive regime at home um, in a country that faces grave problems of, of, of every imaginable kind. Um, but I think nobody takes this seriously. It's, it's like the, the buzzword of stability, right? Stability is a dirty word these days, right? Because yes. people know it's, yes. that stability meant repression, autocracy, yes. uh, and all the rest. And now people are inspired, the, the Egyptians were inspired by Tunisia. Uh, you know, the struggles in Algeria have been going on for quite a while, but have taken on renewed momentum. Uh, Iran and, and, and elsewhere, and of course a place like Bahrain, where, you know, this is an American protectorate. Right? Yes. It was a British protectorate since the late 19th century. It became an American protectorate in the 1970s. The Fifth Fleet is headquartered there. And the United States has helped keep a, a, a minority-based family in power, right? Yes. And of course, all these regimes are, are, are very, very brittle. And the Saudis, not the least of it, right? Yes. Yes. Where, yes. you know, we have this image of all these rich Saudis, endless oil money, right? But this, is a, this, is in, this state is the last refuge on earth of the notion of the divine right of kings, right? This, this country, the ruling class, the dynasty named the country after itself. <laughs> Right? It's like the Bush states of America. Right? <laughs> we think that was probably not a good idea. Right? So they named the country after themselves. Um, there are a lot of poor Saudis, um, and there are a lot of Saudis who, feel, who, uh, who know that they're living in a state where they have no rights whatsoever. It's, it's literally the personal property of the thousand princes or so, and especially the three old guys, right? the king and the crown prince and so on, who are in their 80s, who are ill, they're barely functioning, whereas most of the population is quite young. They want to have a, a normal life, yeah. right? With some degree of participation in their own government and a free press and trade unions and, and on and on, all of which they're denied. And Saudi Arabia too is a protectorate of the United States, right? It's too weak to defend itself, which is why the United States rushed troops there in, in 1990 when there was no real threat to, to prop up this regime. So this order is, is deeply, deeply brittle and we've seen cracks you know, across the board in different ways with the specificities, specificity, specificities of each place, um, but it's, it's, it's tottering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think um, the question- If I, just before, I, I was gonna ask, I should have said before, um, the people who are responsible for the mics, could they bring them up here? And if people have questions, just to start coming up to the mics, if you could just bring them up maybe to the corners and people could line up and we'll start taking questions. So I'm just gonna ask one more question of the panel after this and then we'll open it up. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, okay, that's fine. Right. Oh. Cameraman says no. <laughs> okay, I mean, there's a, there, there's a considerable number of people. I've actually, we've gotten a number of emails and it's uh, very nice at watching from a, from uh, afar, so right. we want to uh, do it right for them. Right, I think uh, for a very long time, um, people in, in our part of the world, in, in, in the so-called Middle East, uh, 
a funny term, middle of where. Um, I'd, I'd much rather call it Western Asia, North Africa, um, have been reduced to sectarian divides, uh, you know, tribes um, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Whereas really, as, as my colleague was saying, these, these uh, uprisings are about fundamental freedoms, about labor uh, rights, about women's rights, and so forth. And I think even though in, in, uh, in, in Bahrain we do see huge um, uh, sectarian divides, but I, I don't think these are at the root of um, people's demands that, oh, you know, we want to have a Shia-led uh, Shia uh, theocracy. I think Iran has shown um, the world that theocracy is a horrendous thing. And uh, we see that in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, that you know, they're very, very different. And as soon as Khamenei, the supreme leader in Iran, made the statement um, in his speech, um, Friday sermon, in Arabic, congratulating the Egyptians on their Islamic revolution, immediately, within minutes, the Muslim Brotherhood made a statement on their website saying, no, thank you very much. This is a people's revolution, so you know, we don't want to know this Iranian kind of... Um, uh, Islamic revolution. So I think the Bahrainis are uh, are equally aware and wary of that. So, well, I'm going to suspend my next question in favor of the people who've lined up. And so, why don't we start to, from my right first? Please just identify yourself if you don't mind quickly and ask your question. And please try to make them, you know, questions. Right. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Kurt. Uh, it's probably too early in the movement right now, or in, in this whole revolutionary process right now to answer this, but if you had to get into the minds of the Islamic militant groups, such as Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, what do you think they're thinking right now in terms of strategy and in terms of recruitment? Do, do, do you think... And if you'd like to, I mean, if you'd like to identify yourself... It, oh, yeah, it, it, no, I, uh, I, I said my name's Kurt. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't quite... Okay, that's oh, fine. Sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it. Go ahead. That's <laughs> Who would like to take that? Second? Well, I'll, I'll say something. The first thing I'd say is you can't lump all these groups together. They're, yeah. they're, they're quite different, right? Hamas is a Palestinian religious nationalist group. Hezbollah has deep roots in, in, in Lebanese society. Al-Qaeda is a whole other thing. So that's, that's the first thing that must be said. Um, in, in fact, what's gone on in the, in the region is, is a huge defeat for Al-Qaeda. In fact, offers the best alternative one can imagine. Because here we have uh, the strategy of Al-Qaeda going back to the mid-1990s was, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to strike at the United States because we can't overthrow the Egyptian regime and the various other regimes we'd like to overthrow. They're too strong. We've tried that, right? And there were radical Islamist insurgencies crushed by these states. So we're going to strike at the United States and provoke them to intervene in various ways. And this will set the stage for conditions which will allow us to get rid of these apostate regimes in Egypt and elsewhere. So the fact that you have millions of people in the streets across the Arab world and in Iran, you know, demanding democracy, demanding representative government, demanding social justice, totally destroys the strategy of this tiny minority crazed, you know, bunch of people off in the, in the caves of, of Pakistan. So I think that's extremely important. Um, the other side of it is, uh, you know, Islamist movements are part of the local scene, right? I mean, just talking about Egypt. The Muslim brothers have been part of Egyptian society for 80 years, right? Three or four generations. They're not going anywhere, right? And repression doesn't work to deal with them, right? That's been tried by the Nasser regime, by Sadat, by Mubarak. They're still there, right? In a free election, they would get some percent of the vote, but there's no alternative. One, I, I don't like their politics, right? They're you know, have these conservative Islamist politics. I don't share them. A lot of Egyptians don't share them. But, you know, you have to let them compete, right? Just as in this country, much as we don't like them, we don't suppress, you know, uh, Christian fundamentalists. If they want to run elections, they'll run elections. Let's put it to the test. The alternative is, is the kind of horrific, you know, civil war, which people are very aware of, which Algeria experienced. Mm -hmm. And people are very aware of this, and they want to find some other route to create a situation in which... Everybody can compete, and you have a democratic system, and, and, and autocratic regimes don't remain in power by citing the, the Islamist threat. Did you want to make a comment, Karina? Uh, 
Uh, I want to say I think one of the one of the really important things that's happened in the last couple of months is the way that the seeming hold, and I, I really stress the word seeming, the seeming hold on the oppositional space in many of these countries by fundamentalist movements has really been broken, and they have been shown in some ways to be uh, irrelevant. There was this very interesting moment in the February 12th demonstration in Algiers when Ali Belhaj, who's the number two of the Islamic Salvation Front from the 1990s, showed up with about 50 of his uh, activists and uh, Al Jazeera trumpeted this all day long on uh, television. What they didn't say is that the protesters actually started chanting, assassin, assassin, uh, you know, you're an assassin, and then many of the other young people had absolutely no idea who he was. So it, it was interesting, a strong reaction against or sort of total uh, irrelevance. But that said, I do think that in certain contexts, either organized, uh, fundamentalist political movements, uh, or those that can now organize rapidly based on sort of the, the social Islamization of, of society in recent years in countries like Algeria, can benefit from this transitional time, which may be a difficult time. Uh, that is in no way an excuse for avoiding the changes that have to be made. I think it is rather a, a sort of call to uh, progressives and civil society uh, elsewhere uh, to work with and to support progressives and civil society in these countries uh, as they, they seek to counter uh, these forces which um, perhaps should be allowed to uh, function in ways uh, that respect the democratic process, uh, but uh, that's not a neutral thing. And, and the fee people who are, uh, who are going to be uh, seeking to counter them, including women's movements, are often going to have much less political and other kinds of power at their disposal. Uh, the fundamentalists have transnational networks, and these progressive forces will need them too. Uh, if I can say uh, I think it's also important to point out that the, one of the central tenets of American policy in the Middle East since World War II has been to destroy any kind of leftist alternatives to the American way, right? So <laughs> Americans spent enormous amounts of resources going after communists, socialists, and then when they were gone, it was anybody who seemed left-leaning. Mm. And so uh, one of the results is that the political spectrum in most countries of the Middle East has shifted over the decades way over to the right, so that being leftist means I don't know what it means now. You know, I, I don't have gravy on my mashed potatoes when I go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, so, I mean, the, the, that meant then that the language of equality, of freedom, of democracy, of justice couldn't be expressed in those secular left terms, right? So the only language that seemed to be left and was available to be expressed in was the religious right that was using this language, right? And so this is a part of the reason why these groups like the Taliban, Hamas, Hezbollah, et cetera, have become so powerful is because they're, the, they're what's left to speak for the people or claim to speak for the people. Um, and so I think what's important about these events of the last couple of weeks is that the language has shifted, the space has shifted, right? And so those groups aren't the only ones who can talk about freedom, justice, democracy, equality anymore. I'm going to call the next person. I just want to say it's interesting that, um, it, say, in Egypt, I mean, what you said about the brotherhood, of course the brotherhood was there in, in these events, but from what I understand from the workers' movement that took place in, you know, in Suez region, because of their fundamentalist values, when you have this sort of uh, strike movement and their, and their concept of, of protecting private property rights, they didn't particularly support the movement early. And then later on, that sort of uh, somewhat explains when people are in, uh, to, in the square, why they also are standing back, that there is this historic sort of uh, divide, and they, they weren't the ones leading the upsurge. They, they were left back by history. They somehow uh, missed it. That doesn't mean they're not going to be around. Anyway, Zachary knows this much better than I do. I would like to call on the next person. I am half American, half Libyan. I just yes. returned yes. from Libya two weeks ago. And I was there just as we were starting to feel a military presence, not a military presence, but a security presence. We were just starting to notice more and more police on it. And I apologize, this is not a question, so I've tried to keep them all in bullet points, as my job has taught me. And I wanted to make one comment to start off with, with your note about the 1.6 billion uh, barrels. Million. If, would, would we really feel them and would it really matter? I think Italy and Germany might have an issue with that. They were benefiting, benefiting from that during the embargo as well. But to, to that note, my grandfather, who was an uneducated farmer, Libyan, uh, my mom's American, my father is Libyan, um, when they nationalized the oil and said, people will have their oil, my grandfather said, if I'm going to have my oil, 
give me my barrel in my backyard. <laughs> Not a single Libyan has oil. We don't no. have access to it. We never did. So I just wanted to make that comment. So um, somebody up here made a comment about shooting on our own people, about the military shooting on its own people. They have not shot on their own people. Any word that has come out has been from mercenaries, has been from people who have been drugged. Truly, when Gaddafi actually and, and Safe came out and said, people are out there being drugged, people, they're, they're drugging them, they're on, on their, basically they were admitting to their own crimes and it came out later. There's footage on, <coughs> online and on video. And I just want to say that um, with respect to women's rights and so on, we're a little behind on that in Libya, but it's there. I mean, I was there. I, I go like this in Libya. My sister's here. We, we go out any way we want. Doesn't matter. We're there. So we, my cousins are covered. I'm not. It doesn't matter. We are, mo in the sense of women, it's a very, and religion, it's a very modern state. There, we don't have a fear of this becoming a religious state after this happens. We know there's tr a transition government happening right now. They're not releasing names. They're not letting it out. Um, there was women protest. Women were out, and women, young women were out protesting in Derna today. And I think he went after Derna. I'm not sure. I'm, I can't remember. But what's happening right now is that it's closing in on Tripoli. And once Tripoli falls, we've got it. So it's basically closing in from the from the west, from the east, and from the west, and slowly making its way into Tripoli. Uh, Libya, the Libyan youth movement right now is feels that it's or knows that it's been hacked into and being monitored by people of the government. So basically they're saying, be careful, know what you say. Nobody cares. This is a generation that does not fear anymore. This is not my father's generation that lived in fear. My generation that lived in the shadow of that fear and was sent out of our rooms when hangings were happening and being aired on television. This, going back to Tripoli in the last two or three years when things opened up, I saw a generation that was, that is in touch with social networks, that is in touch with the internet, that knows what's happening. Safe, who's now being called Zafe, which means fake shot himself in the foot almost by opening up Libya to the West and letting these young people who don't know the history that is being invoked by Gaddafi, don't know what our fathers and grandfathers went through, through that. The educated people like my dad who were basically shunned by the government and, and lived in fear and married foreigners like my dad, of all people he married an American, these people, we, this generation is the generation that's rising and almost like the Obama, um, um, election, these are the kids that are out there saying, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, get out there with us. You know, aunts, uncles, get out there with us. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, and finally, I just wanted to say that um, contact with Libya is very, very sporadic right now. I reached my cousins last night for just a brief, brief moments. And when you get on the phone with them, you hear the exact opposite. They are purposely telling you, this is not happening. Do you understand me? This is not happening. Whereas, of course, we're hearing the exact opposite. My brother was online. You can't always get online, it's sporadic. So we're keeping Skype open. We're keeping Yahoo Messenger open. We're keeping internet open. We're anything we can. Everybody who sent a message out has, knows they're being monitored and are saying the exact opposite of what's happening, so we know. So in the case of Libya, I apologize. I don't have a question. I just wanted to make the oh. comment that I am so <laughs> it's sorry. Very, no, no, this is one, so it's wonderful and, that and you're able to contribute this. It's just, it's, no, no. It's, it's a fabulous, fabulous thing happening right now. We never thought yeah. it would happen. No. And the Arab leaders are quaking in their boots right now. Yes. The only man who stood up to say anything was yes. was the Emir of Qatar. Yes. What do you Syria think? is scared what out of its mind. Could right you now. tell us what he said? He said we did not commit it. He actually said he actually spoke long before yes. we knew which direction this revolution was going. Long before we knew Gaddafi was hiding at Bab Aziziya right smack in the heart of Tripoli 15 minutes from my house. And he said he basically said, we are on the side of the Libyan people. I'm so sorry. I'm just a little nervous about the whole thing. No, no. Go he take said, your time. We, he, the Emir of Qatar came out and said, we are on the side of the Libyan people, long before anybody spoke or said anything. Today, was it today or yesterday? Yes. Yesterday, he also reiterated and came out on Al Jazeera and yes. said, we've not committed a crime. Because the Libyan government came out and said, look at Qatar. They, they've committed a crime. They don't, the guy is behind this and so on. And, he said, we've not committed any crime by siding with Libyan people. We are siding on the humanita hum humanitarian side of this, and everybody should be doing this as well. He's the only one who's done this. We don't see anybody else. Yeah. King of, the King of Jordan is scared out of his mind. They're just waiting. Nobody thought, nobody thought Gaddafi would be toppled. If this man, every family in Libya has his blood. I mean, they, he has touched every family in Libya, everyone, save probably his own, and I wouldn't even doubt that probably his mm -hmm. own has mm -hmm. been killed. So yes. it's, it's very impressive how many Libyan. Thank you.
if we could take um, uh, two or three, two or three questions, Mr. Okay. Ergus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Please. O'Donnell. Hi, I'm Jean Ergos. I wanted to say I'm very moved by everything, everything that's happening in the Arab world. My mother took part in the anti-imperialist struggle in Egypt, and I came home one evening, and she was crying, and the whole thing had just started, and I said, well, what happened? She says, it reminds me when we forced the British out of the Suez Canal Zone, so it was very moving indeed, and the police was shooting at them at that point, so the son of a revolutionary. Uh, I have one question, which is, uh, in 1956, Kamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal and struck a tremendous blow against imperialism, and I'd say for common decency the whole world over, and it really shook everything, and pan-Arabism arose, and it was a very strong movement, and it was obviously not neoliberal. I just want to know, I mean, is this the elephant in the room nobody talks about? I mean, it's been attacks on neoliberalism. I myself was in Cairo once. I used to go on vacation when there was a food riot, because when the IMF said, We'll take off the subsidy. They don't realize people are actually going to starve, which they did almost. It was terrifying. I'm just wondering, I mean, where is, for example, the Nasserist movement or a pan-Arab movement in this whole story? Does it have a future? Is this the past? Is this like saying the FLN in Algeria has had its day? Where are we in this dialogue? Because these people just don't seem to, to be present in the discussion, but I know they're there. Thank you. Uh, if, next, please. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Christian Maylet from the United Nations Democracy Fund. Mm -hmm. The common point between uh, these countries from Algeria to Egypt, where people have been uh, actively demanding or obtaining the departure for, the, for the leaders, is that they have been in their office for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. When in established democracy, generally the maximum is 10 years. So Mr. Lockman, according to you, could we have the same revolution in countries where we have this, uh, this condition, I'm referring to Zimbabwe or Cuba? And my last question is, one thing is to get a political, to, to get a change of regime, another thing is to get a real freedom. According to you, what might be the real social change who could really bring freedom to these people? Thank you. Fidel made an unfortunate comment yesterday. He said that Gaddafi was getting bad press. Hi, um, my name is Adam, and actually I have a related question, a two-part question. Uh, one part is um, how is, what is the impact of this going to be on U.S. influence in the area, U.S. Uh, uh, benefit? In the area, how's this, you know, going to shift the global uh, rivalries of the world? Uh, sort of the mega picture. If people have thoughts on that. And the other question is in relation to. Uh, I like in this situation very much to. Uh, it makes me reminds me of South Africa, where you had this heroic struggle over many years against a U.S. supported uh, dictator and. Uh, at a certain point, the U.S. decided to switch sides on the dictator uh, once their defeat became imminent and quickly uh, embraced and, uh, and some might say um, undermined the uh, new system there so that you had political freedom uh, evolve in South Africa while the shanty towns remained. And what would prevent that from happening uh, in this part of the world. Uh, and the only question, the only last thing I want to say is, while I appreciate the idea that uh, people, your opinions are that this is not, um, this is an indigenous movement, there have been reports of the uh, leaders of the April 6th movement meeting with U.S. diplomats over the last two years. I'm just wondering what your thoughts on that are, you know, the training and the Google executive and all this kinds of thing is, are two things going on? Are there two trends going on? That's my only question. Thanks. Fine. Okay. How about we get to your question after we answer these? Because it's about all I can hold in, yeah. I think, in our collective mind. Uh, so we first have the question uh, uh, referring to 1956 and the birth of the Nasserite uh, movement and pan-Arabism in the Middle East, and well, North Africa, well, no, in the Middle East. And uh, what is the fate of pan-Arabism, and whether Nasserite or otherwise? That's somebody. Um, I can take a stab at it. Uh, let me put it. 
I think one of the things to keep in mind is that the, how do you put it, if you think back on other kinds of spectacular regime failures like Russia or Iran in 79, uh, it brought about a change in the regime. It made changes internally in the societies, and there were significant changes. But ultimately, the revolutions didn't change the global system. They didn't change the, 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 the international order that these countries operated in. And this was also one of the problems with the pan-Arab movement, Nasserism in Egypt, was that it was ultimately to succeed had to be autarkic. It couldn't have, it, it couldn't operate within a global system of capitalism. Um, and so it had to open up again and that was what Sadat's solution was to the problems created by Nasser's autarkism was uh, adopt this neoliberal stance, right? I mean, and hope that this would bring more investment, this would bring more opportunity, this would bring more jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you, uh, the, the people of the Middle East, and these people, people in the countries in which there have been these uprisings and, and their, the regimes have collapsed, now confront that very serious problem, right? How does one actually move beyond this global system as it exists today? I think Zachary wants to say something. Yeah, I would just add that, uh, you know, most of Egypt's population was not uh, born before Hosni Mubarak took power in 1981. So uh, although we think of Nasser as a historic figure, a tremendous figure, and, and of course he played a very important role, he's ancient history for most yeah. young people. Mm -hmm. And although there are a few Nasserists around, all right, they're insignificant. People have very different concerns and a very different uh, vision of the world. Yeah, I, 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 I just want to comment. It's interesting. You have, I mean, these sort of movements in different regions in Latin America, pan, pan uh, uh, movements or in, in the Middle East occur again and again. So it's interesting in the process, the sort of uh, progressive process over years of, a, of movement towards independence, self-rule, uh, 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 democracy. So you have the pan-Arabism that came from the, the military officers who are nationalist and, and in their time, progressive military officers who overthrew royal houses and had, of course, some sort of internationalist sentiment between them, which broke down very quickly uh, into, in its separate movements. If anything, this sort of internationalism or pan-Arab movement, insofar as it's going to exist, it seems like it, it's reborn in the fact that there's some feeling of common struggle at the present time, that clearly there is something common, the fact of the inspiration of peoples from one country to the other. Now, whether that'll be raised to the level of, you know, theory and ideological movement and so forth. It is quite interesting if that took place. Um, but so, um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that, but if not, uh, our, uh, our Could I just put in, just yes. uh, because the yes. question of the United States role, the fact that you know people from the April 6th movement may have met with American ah, yes. officials, I think is, is insignificant. And the people in the streets, you know, again, they're, they're very aware of the challenges they face. The United States, it seems to me, has a, there's a central contradiction in terms of its policy towards the Middle East, right? Because it professes values of democracy, supporting democracy, human rights. But I think they also understand in Washington that any government that is democratic, that in, in some fuller sense represents the will of, of its people, is going to be less likely to take orders from Washington. Mm -hmm. So then what do yes. you do, right? Yes. Right. On, on the other hand, on the one hand, of course, they, I think it was clear in Washington, Mubarak had to go. But you would like to preserve as much of the old order as you can. Whether they'll get away with that remains to be seen. Right. Um, but they understand that a, that a democratic government in Tunisia, Algeria, wherever it might be, is, is not going to be, again, uh, amenable to following American policy dictates. Sure. So that's going to be a, an interesting development in which we can have some, some role in the, in the months and years ahead. Sure. Um, I, could say, just, I could say one more thing sure. about that too. Um, I think it also in terms of thinking about future American influence in the region, I think one thing to think about is how the Americans and its European allies have responded to these demonstrations and collapse of the regime so far, which has been basically to say um, the EU decided to set up a fund basically to help rebuild the economies of countries that have been disrupted in these revolts, right? So it's like Okay, you've had your fun, you had your demonstration, you overthrew this nasty bastard for us, thanks. Now get back to work. Yeah. Right? So it's, yeah. that doesn't seem to be to be to bode well for increased American influence in the region, right? Because it's, it's ultimately, it's the business as usual is what we're calling for. 
Well, in, in the modern terminology, that isn't the terminology the movements of the left or progressive movements, historically democratic movements have used, um, there is this distinction between um, elite replacement and regime change, uh, which in a, a more traditional language would be sort of a social revolution, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, there is something progressive at certain times for removing a leader and, and another section of the elite mm -hmm. coming in who then get, right. has to be, you know, accessible to public pressure. So how far these things will go with, uh, obviously the army is in charge of uh, Egypt sure. and, and, we, and most of the people, the younger generals are all trained by the United States. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. But right. anyway, there's this sure. distinction and how far will the revolutions go is of mm -hmm. course a question. Sure. Um, if I could just quickly, um, one that was directed at Professor uh, Lachman was uh, from a friend from the US, uh, UN uh, Democracy Fund. Uh, anybody who's in power more than 10 years, is this something that's going to spread to, uh, in particular, Zimbabwe and Cuba was the question. Gee, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that's, that's really uh, all I could yes. say. I Why it's, not? Yes. Right? I, and, and I think one of the most fun things about all of this over the last month is how uh, the, the Chinese government felt yes. obliged, right, to block the internet site mm -hmm. for any mention of Egypt, and now they're freaking out about the Jasmine Revolution threat, yes. right? right? There are regular may, maybe meetings one, one being person held. off in the boonies with a with a website, as yeah. far as well, anyone last, knows. The but last it, round was like 32 but, cities. You know, I think. tyrants yeah. quake everywhere when these kinds of things happen, and that's that's yeah. a hopeful kind of thing. Uh, please. Um, last week we had a panel um, at Rutgers. Um, discussing these events, and we had a colleague, Oseina Alidu, uh, who, um, who comes from Niger, and her, um, her interests are of the sub-Sahel Africa, and she was connecting the events in North Africa to the sort of, you know, central to uh, South Africa, and she was talking about how the very issues that people face uh, and are unhappy about in, in Egypt are very similar to Africa, uh, to the rest of Africa. And she was um, a little disappointed of, of uh, the same way that I have been as well um, to, to, to call these uprisings as, as Arab and so forth because it ignores uh, sub-Sahel Africa. It ignores Afghanistan, it ignores Iran, it ignores the rest of the world. Um, so it for sure, it, can, it already has. There has been demonstrations in Senegal and, and elsewhere, so. Just quickly, the third question we had, uh, I'm going to get to you, <laughs> is how, what is the impact on U.S., in, what will be the impact on U.S. influence uh, in the area? There was another question that I, a B to that question, which I interpreted as, uh, well, the United States switched sides when it saw what was happening in South Africa, when it became unproductive to continue to support the apartheid regime, and what that did uh, in a way that the revolution didn't go to you know, actually, uh, it would have been a you know a violent confrontation and perhaps a complete destruction of the old system. You got a certain preservation of the underlying political economic system uh, in that. So, is this uh, somewhat the uh, strategy? I think that's how I understood the second half. I'll say a little bit about this. I mean, this is my sort of totally non-pragmatic, completely unrealistic answer. It seems to me that. If President Obama really wanted to embrace the message of his election, there is this sort of magical moment now where we could reconstruct an entirely new relationship uh, with this part of the world. And you're right, there's many parts of the world here, but I'm thinking particularly about uh, perhaps uh, the, the Arab world, <laughs> the Muslim world, whichever problematic term you want to use, uh, by really showing ourselves to be on the side of or listening to or understanding the youth movements and explaining that we now understand that we have supported deeply offensive governments that have violated the rights of their own people for years and that we seek a new relationship with this part of the world and really reaching out to these young people. Now, of course, realistically, President Obama wants to be reelected and he has to answer to all sorts of interests, uh, including uh, the, the pro-Israel lobby and others that would make taking a position like that perhaps very difficult, but if, if the US US really wants to think about a new kind of influence in the region. I think it's about building relationships with people as opposed to these now collapsing uh, and, and deeply flawed uh, power structures. Right, and also addressing the issues here at home. I mean, what we're witnessing in Wisconsin, we've seen signs of people um, asking, you know, 18 days in Egypt, how many days in Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. And uh, constantly you hear about where is our Tahrir Square? Where is our Liberation Square? So it's not just about people elsewhere because ov obviously here we have democracy and everything is hunky-dory. That's not quite 
uh, how a lot of Americans feel. And they're actually being inspired by, by Egyptians and, and North Africans and Muslims. Sorry, can I just add? Sure, yeah, Sorry, there's one thing I forgot to say, a specific thing to show you the influence the United States can have. The, uh, the French, German, and American governments spoke out after the February 12th protest on Algeria and called for Algerians to have the right uh, to peacefully demonstrate in their capital city. And many of the demonstrators a week later, on February 19th, believed that the response of the police was less violent than it would have been otherwise because of that statement. Now, though Algerians are, as a journalist expressed to me, allergic to uh, foreign interference given their history, this kind of statement was something they very much welcomed. Yeah, I, I just have to say, I mean, if someone's who studied the history, it, it, the world changes. So there's the history of, we could look at the history of colonialism being thrown out, and then the history of neo-colonialism. Now this is sort of this global era thing. There was a time when people demonstrated and told the big powers to get out. It's very it's kind of a little strange. They're saying, where the hell are you when we need you? <laughs> now, I'm not saying there's you know illusions about these things, and there still aren't these contradictions. But somehow, there's theoretical uh, things that, there's some theory that has to be done to explain what is this relationship in a, in a global area. It's, it's not the neo-colonial pictures, it's not the colonial pictures, it's a global picture. It doesn't mean it's not exploitive, but it's different. And uh, how, that, how that relates. And I, I think, think generally on progressive and left circles, uh, there's a certain lag in time that, that, with, with uh, theory. But anyway, that's just, there's no co in content. But can we have our next question? Our, it's, it looks like it should be the last, I think, the last question, unless everybody gets upset. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> At the question and the answer, then. <laughs> uh, my name is Sai. I'm a second semester student in GPIA. Yes. Uh, my question, uh, speaking of elephants in the room and deeply offensive states, and somebody also mentioned the word fascism, um, and this sense of pan-Arabic consciousness in terms of revolution, my question is, um, you know, the, uh, the state of Israel, and the Palestinian question, which was central to this kind of Arab nationalism of the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. um, doc, uh, Professor Lockman had mentioned uh, Israel, and it seems like Washington still gets a lot of its directives from Israel. So my question is, you know, double-sided in the sense, you know, how does the Israeli state view these so-called revolutions in the mm -hmm. Middle East? And also, when and how much long, when will the revolution hit Palestine or how much longer do we have to put up with the nonsense of the Israeli state? <laughs> so, okay, maybe we'll be here a while. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to stay. <laughs> Zach? Well, I'm not sure where to start. Who, who doesn't know anything about this, right? No. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Yeah, well, um, I mean, certainly, I, well, to put it very... Briefly, um, the Israelis are sort of freaking out by what's going on. Okay. <laughs> when I say Israelis, I mean the government circles and, and so on. Um, their uh, hegemony in the region has been predicated on the fact that Egypt is, you know, out of the picture as, as any threat or as any source of confrontation. So, of course, they're very nervous that that may, may change. I think it's uh, very unlikely that, that e Egyptians will find it in their interest to renounce the, the treaty. But... Again, they will take a more nationalist stance and, and probably a more pro-Palestinian stance or be less compliant with the dictates of, of the United States uh, and, and of Israel. So from a, from a strategic point of view, that's a, a problem for Israel given you know, the fact that it's, it has its most hardline and right-wing government in its, in its history. I mean, what, what it illustrates is that um, the, the Israeli vision um, that it can make deals with, with dictatorial Arab regimes, right, with... with the Egypt of Sadat and Mubarak and with the Hashemite monarchy in Jordan, and, and that'll be enough ultimately to enable it to continue to repress the Palestinians and, and deny them self-determination, that strategy is, is, is short-sighted. It may work for a couple of decades, it won't work forever. So it faces the alternative, the, 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 the choice it, it is long faced, maybe more starkly now than ever before, it can either try to reach some accommodation with the Palestinian national movement, or it will face endless conflict and, and escalating conflict. Um, and for the United States, uh, again, it, it changes the equation somewhat. Again, we have to see how this plays out. But uh, American power in the region has, is based on it, right, its, its alliance with, with Israel, but also with these conservative right, Arab yeah. autocracies. Um, and that, too, 
suddenly looks a little less stable than it once did. So there may need to be accommodations uh, in various ways. Uh, again, how that plays out, I wouldn't uh, venture to predict. But, um, but at least it opens up new kinds of, of possibilities for the future. Karima? I was in Palestine and in Israel in early December, and I was very struck by how bad the situation is. You go some places, and it's uh, less bad than it seems to be on TV. In, in Palestine, the situation seemed to be to be much worse than is being portrayed. The ongoing humanitarian impact of the wall, which was something I thought I understood from far away, uh, is, is just incredible. I, the last day I was there, I stood in line for 45 minutes. I, I was on a bus, and I stood in line for 45 minutes in the very cold wind, uh, trying to get across the checkpoint at the wall with a woman holding a sick infant that was just screaming that she was trying to get to the hospital. And you stand there, and there's this sort of turnstile not operated by any human being, and you don't know when and it's gonna turn, and there was this sort of horrible crush of people. So, I mean, the human rights situation is, is really dire. I think there's a lot of attention being given to Gaza, and deserv deservedly so with the blockade uh, and the humanitarian impact of that. But in a way, I, I think we're not paying nearly enough attention to what's happening in terms of the, the encroaching uh, colonization of, of the West Bank and the settlements and, and so on. So I'm really glad you asked uh, the question. I spent a lot of time asking people when I was there in December, when will the next intifada be? And I don't think I realized it was gonna be everywhere all over the place very, very soon, uh, but there so far. Um, to me, one of the critical pieces of the question that you asked is what the impact is going to be on the U.S. response, which ties this to the last question. All of the major Republican, likely Republican candidates in the next election have visited Israel in the last six weeks or so, I think. <laughs> and I mean, I have to say I've been a little bit critical of President Obama. I also understand he's in an incredibly difficult political situation because he's going to be accused in the next election of being the man who lost is, uh, Egypt, right? So that's going to be a, a real card that's going to be played, and I think this is really going to affect how he's going to think that he can position himself. Uh, so to me, that's a really critical piece that we need to, be, uh, that we need to really be talking about and challenging. Well... I guess I get to have the, I'm sorry. No, no. If, if there's time, a quick question. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Hardy. Or, I'm a Venezuelan first. diplomat to the United Nations. I just, um, I just want to follow up on something that was, uh, has already been touched upon. Uh, Professor Donald made uh, some of, some have a similar question. What will happen um, with Iran? What is the prospect for Iran in the region? Um, it has been said that after U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, the most powerful player in both countries nowadays is Iran. Um, the, the two warships, Iranian warships, were sent through the Suez Canal for the first time since 1979. So Iran is making a show of force and is trying to see what will happen. So what is the future of Iran in the region? Um, and uh, hopefully uh, see your perspective on that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, Iran has benefited from the invasions, as you uh, rightly mentioned, uh, um, and has tried to abuse every conflict um, to its own benefit, has tried to export its theocracy uh, elsewhere, but is facing um, uh, mounting protests and opposition at home. Uh, so right today, the Minister of Intelligence gave a very long interview about how they were going to go ahead and, and uh, completely destroy the opposition uh, and so forth. So I think they're going to be quite involved on the home front, uh, um, tackling the protests that are mounting. And uh, there are many predictions that the Islamic Republic will fall in the next few years. Um, so um, it, they will have to look at their domestic, they're gonna have to concentrate on their domestic problems rather than try to take advantage of, of the situation elsewhere. And uh, uh, Egyptians and others have been very good at um, uh, telling Iran to stay off and that they have uh, nothing to, to, be, to gain from, from these uh, uprisings. Any, any other comments? Both the Palestinian Authority and Hamas get over it yeah. and, and work to yeah. reunify the Palestinian national movement so yeah. it can actually confront the occupation. But that's that's yeah. a very hopeful development, yeah. I think. That's, again, what? a fallout of yeah. what's been going on throughout the region. Breaking the status quo when there's such 
ossification everywhere from the top, from the bottom, breaking the status quo. Can't, you know, it's the only way to go. We'll see. Who knows? Um, I, let me just say, I also want to, I, I don't know if this was done in the beginning, but I want to thank my colleagues, Jonathan Bach from the Undergraduate International Affairs Program here, and um, also uh, Stephen Collier from the uh, GPI, the graduate program, who worked with me in organizing this. And look, when the Algerian Revolution took place, it shook the world, okay? When the Libya, when Libyan uh, first was, was uh, freed from the king and the oil nationalized and the American and British bases kicked out, it shaked all sorts of things, the oil, the oil world and so forth. The uh, uh, Nasser shook the world with the, with the revolution there. Who kn and now all this happening at the same time. I don't know what's going to come of it, but I feel much more enlightened after listening to our, our <laughs> I think, after listening to our uh, guests who kindly came here and spent the night with us. So I ask for, a, please, a round of uh, applause for them. And I assure you that I mean, what we do is international affairs, so hopefully we'll keep doing this kind of thing, and you can look to the new school to continue to provide this.